Yeah, I mean, I had the flu right after this year. I, I haven't reflected a whole lot. Um, Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. But um, as I reflect on the series, uh, obviously wish we were still playing. Um, our inability to close out game three was crucial. Obviously, game five, we gave ourselves a chance, uh, which is which is all you can ask for on the road uh, against a very good team that is obviously has so much playoff experience. Um, you know, but again, your, your your competitive juices are still flowing, and you're watching them play Memphis, and you know you think if a couple of things would have gone our way, if we did a couple of things differently, maybe we could have extended that series, and you know, who knows what happens. Um, I really felt we were going to come home for a game six here, and I thought about what the what the environment atmosphere would have been like, and how uh, impactful that could have been for young guys like a Bones Highland, just to the more he experiences that, as well as other players. So. Uh, still disappointed, uh, but extremely proud of our, of our guys for not being a team that was just going to roll over, uh, give in, and kind of let go of the rope. Um, but losing, well, as I said after the game, losing sucks. Uh, and when the season comes to an abrupt end like that, it's always hard, uh, individually and collectively. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, we have a first round pick. So, you know, part of it is getting ready uh, for the draft. You know, I, th I think this is a huge off season. I really do for me uh, being here seven years and we've done a lot of really good things. Four years in the playoffs, 48 wins this year, all that. But uh, I think this might be the biggest off season, at least for me and my perspective, since I've been here. Um, my, my mindset is everybody wants to just say, well, it's just Michael and Jamal coming back healthy. I think that's a starting block, but it doesn't end there. We, we, we have a window, uh, and, and I think windows are only open so long. We have a 27-year-old phenom who will soon, hopefully soon be named a back-to-back -back MVP. We have to capitalize while we have a player, a special player, Nicola, and do everything that we can as an organization, and I know we will, to, to put the best players around him, to give ourselves the best chance to win a world championship. That is what motivates Stan and Josh Kroenke. That is what motivates Tim Connolly and Calvin Booth. That is what motivates me, is finding a way to put the best team together next season, moving forward, to, to try to win a championship. So you, we have the draft coming up uh, in the next couple of months. You have um, Summer League, which I think would be a really important Summer League. Uh, you have free agency. You have trades. You have all that. But... Um, I always tell our players they have to come back better players. We, as a coaching staff, have to come back improved and find ways to help this team. Our defense against Golden State was not good enough. I think we have the, 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 the six, 16th ranked defense in the playoffs, which is dead last <laughs> against a very good team. But you know, we, as a coaching staff, me as a head coach, have to find ways to help our players, and uh, and and that's our that's our mindset. That's our goal this off season to come back and improve team. Uh, across the board. There's been a lot of coaching stuff back there. Can you talk about some of that specifically? Is there a team you get better as an individual, or are there particular types of players that you are missing that you feel that the coach has got to add back to our offense? Yeah, it's funny. When you break down our defense, I think we ranked 15th in defensive rating after 82 games. Um, not bad, not great. You know, just right in the middle. Um, but not good enough, Adam. I mean, we had the number six offense in the NBA. Offense has long not been an issue for us. So when you break down the defense, um, I thought our three-point defense was really good. We were a top 10 three-point defense in a three-point happy league. So that, that was a positive. Our defensive rebounding was number one. That was a positive. Where we had trouble was it started on offense. We gave up 17 and a half points a game off turnovers. So we fueled teams break. We gave them easy baskets. And then in the half court, our, our inability to guard one-on-one, -on -one, contain the ball, which led to a lot of rim attacks. And I think we were 30th in opponents' rim field goal percentage. We were 29th in blocks per game. It's a bad combination if you struggle to guard the ball in the perimeter and you don't have the Kemba Mutombo blocking shots behind you. And so we have to get better in terms of guarding our paint. We gave up 50 points a night in our paint, which is, I think, bottom five in the NBA. Um, so that is a big concern and area that I think we need to focus on. And you can work on that individually. Guys can get better in terms of guarding, containing. 
Um, but I think it's something where you, you can't bleed at the rim the way we bled at the rim this year uh, and, and expect to, uh, to be an elite defense. And, and I think to be a dangerous, deep playoff team, you have to have an elite defense. And, and I, I think that's one of our areas that we have to you know, really focus on moving forward. Well, I, I think just in general, when you think of, you know, the, the really good one-on-one -on -one defenders, um, yeah, I think there's definitely a, a mindset. You know, you can teach all you want, proper technique, lateral quickness, defensive slides, um, but there's also a, a physicality, a toughness, an aggressiveness, you know, guys that, you know, like just throughout the last 30 years, the best perimeter defenders are, tough ass dudes. <laughs> I mean, Mar Marcus Smart's the first small to win defensive player of the year since Gary Payton won it. What do those two have in common? I think that answers your question. Just a mentality that I'm going to be in you the whole night. You're going to feel me and you're not going to like playing against me. And I, I think those are really positive attributes to have as a player and especially on defense. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I think, to be honest with you, B, I think that's hard to teach. I, I think that's one of those things like you, you can have it or maybe not have it. But I'll say this, you know, I remember, you know, 82 games is such a long season. And there's so many parts to a season. Uh, but as I reflect on it, and I look at Bones Highland, for example, and we came back from a road trip and, and I, I called him in the next day and we had a heart-to-heart. -heart. And I said, right now, I said, you, you got to understand this. You, you're... Every time you play, you're earning a reputation. And teams are going at you right now, and you're letting them. That's not a reputation you want because everybody talks. Um, I said, I know you're not the biggest, strongest guy. We can't control that right now. You're going to get stronger. But what you can control is your fight. So I know who you are. I know who, where you're from and what your story is. Bring that to the table. If somebody's going to score on you, make them feel you. Don't let it be so easy where they say, we got one. We're going to go to this every time. You don't want that reputation. And I felt, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth right now. I, I felt once Bones realized that, I felt he made a much greater effort, concerted effort to say, you know what? I am going to fight. I am going to compete. I'm going to make people work. They may score on me, but it's not going to be that easy. And that's what you want. You want the want to. You want the desire uh, and you want just to fight. You know, you want guys that are willing to go out there and make people feel them and fight. And I felt bones. That was great to see his progress this year. Like there, there are different levels of the season. Like I thought bones this season was a huge positive. I thought Zeke Naji before getting hurt was a huge positive, um, you know, as a second year player. And so now we have a rookie and a second year player improving and showing that they can help this team, uh, which, you know, it's, it's important to have that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for every player, you know, the word we use a lot is discipline, whether it's a game plan discipline, whether it's knowing your personnel discipline. Um, I think that's always part of it for a young player. So much was thrown at Bones this year, understanding the terminology, understanding what our philosophy is. I think that's part of it, too, just being a lot more disciplined, uh, getting stronger. And, and yes, he can light the scoreboard up. You know, and, and he gets the crowd going and he gets going. But I think for Bones, it's um, being better on defense, and which is a goal for all of our players, not just Bones Highland. And also, I think when Bones is making shots, you see the flexing, you see the crowd. But when you're not making shots, you know, staying the same. You know, you can't be a guy that when you're making shots, everything is great. And when you miss shots, you drop your head and you're jogging back on defense handling adversity because the ball is going to go in some nights, other nights it's not going to go in. But the effort, the effort you give cannot be up and down. And I'm not saying it was like that all season, but just a young kid learning to handle adversity on the court, I think that's going to help him. And it, it got better as the season went along. No, I think we have some, you know, I, I, I think, you know, think about the season. Once Michael Porter went down, Aaron Gordon slid over to the small forward. Jeff Green went from being a backup big to a starting power forward. And 
you know, throughout the season, you guys watched it, you know, all 82 regular season and all five in the playoff. Aaron Gordon was a guy that we put on Jordan Poole, John Morant. Uh, I mean, you name it. You know, Aaron Gordon was a guy that we, he was our fire extinguisher. Hey, we need you to put this fire out. And, uh, and I felt throughout the season, I felt overall Aaron was really good at that. And, and I think just having some other guys like that who understand, hey, my job, I thought Austin Rivers. Uh, I felt Austin Rivers and what he did defensively for us uh, was impactful. And, and, and you kind of saw a player who's a 10-year vet who kind of realized, and I've been, you know, me and Austin have communicated the last few days, and he even said it, you know, I was a scorer most of my career. For this team, I realized my, my job here is not to worry about shots and scoring. It is to guard the other team's best player and bring that defense, bring that mindset to the game every night. And I think once you saw Austin kind of realize that, the buy-in, the commitment, he, he had a, a real positive impact on that second unit. And, uh, you know, that was great to see. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to get together and have a lot of, I think, really uh, in-depth conversations about the entire roster, you know, um, all the different scenarios, you know, moving forward to, to figure out, you know, what what's the best avenue of building our best team? You know what I mean? And and I think it all starts with Nicola. Like we have to make sure we're surrounding him with, with players and pieces that bring out the best in him. Um, but you know, Austin's two years here, I think, have been they kind of speak for themselves. Uh, you know, last season helping us win a playoff series in Portland, um, getting him kind of basically off the street, if you will, and then this year bringing him back and. Um, you know, he was a pro. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have conversations about Austin as well as everybody else as we kind of, uh, you know, get into this offseason. Was there a stretch over the course of the season where you could have been strong if you played Paul Washington, if you didn't sit him, if you didn't take over because Paul was the best? Uh, great question, Vic. You know, um, it's funny. As we started this past season, I remember talking about the first 20 games and how important they were and how I, I think, you know, if you win – if you go 12 and eight in your first 20, you're gonna have a chance to be a playoff team. We were 10 and 10. Um, and, and obviously you know, that's, that's been, been disappointing for me is that two years in a row, we haven't gotten off to the starts that we wanted to, or I feel that we need to. Um, but I felt early in the year, the defense you know, was, was really good. I think there were, there were stretches where the defense was, uh, you know, if you look at, we had a, I think we went 12 and two right around going into the break and coming out of the break. And that was a key stre a stretch because that allowed us to get some separation from being a 500 team. Um, so I, I, I do feel the defense was solid at times, but wasn't consistent enough. So I can't say that for 82 games, our defense was poor. I never felt that because uh, I was constantly looking at the last five, last 10, month by month. Hey, the defense was good. And then it would just bottom out. Like, I mean, the, the drop that we would have at times was quite remarkable. So you need consistency to be an elite defensive team. We did not have that. And what made that hard? Yeah, obviously, we, we, Zeke Naji was a very good defensive uh, player for us. P.J. Dozier was a really important piece that I don't think people realize. And when you lose a Michael, a P.J., a Vladko, a Zeke, we had smalls and we had bigs. We didn't have many wings. And that, that was a... It was just the nature you know, of the beast, and that's where D. Reed came in, and I thought, you know, kind of helped. He's not a wing, if you will, but he gave us some size. He was like a P.J. Dozier for us. So, uh, but that, that's our challenge next year, Vic, is finding a way to – it can't be peaks and valleys. It has to be a lot more consistent on that defensive end. Are you, are there any teams in your expectations that fall behind the Yeah, uh, just you know, take, it, take it slow. You know, I mean, not expecting uh, bubble Jamal Murray, not not expecting peak Michael Porter right away. I mean, it's obviously this really important offseason for both those guys. And, um, you know, they weren't able to play this year. And that was you know, obviously, you know, tough for a lot of people to understand and um, embrace. But you know, just they just weren't ready. And, and th that's really all there was to it. There was never any pressure on those guys. And, um, you know, Jamal, I felt, was was close at times. And just wasn't meant to be. Michael was ramping up. I was just speaking to him upstairs, and I felt, man, Michael's going to play this year. Then he had a setback. So, you know, those were the breaks. But going into next season, Harrison, um, 
I, I think, tempered excitement. You know, and, and as the season goes along, I think they're going to get more and more comfortable. They're going to get their rhythm back, their confidence back, and then they're going to get back to their old selves. But that's not going to be the case come October or whatever when the first game comes around. It's, you know, we're going to have to have patience with those two. Uh, I don't. I don't feel like we've come up short. You know, um, especially when you take in, into account all the circumstances this year. Um, I think with no Jamal Murray and once Michael Porter went down early November, that changed the. For me, it did change the outlook. Um, you know, you take two max players off any team in the NBA. I think they're going to have a hard time uh, winning 48 games, probably. With that being said, yeah, I mean, what motivates all of us, and and I, I don't know how many other teams in the NBA have the alignment, the vision, shared vision and communication that we have from Stan and Josh to Tim, Cal, myself, that's what drives and motivates all of us. I mean, and I, and I know for a fact that, as you mentioned, you know, the Cronkies have won Super Bowls, they won Stanley Cups. Uh, and the one thing missing is an NBA World Championship. And, uh, and that's what motivates us and will be our driving force as we move forward. And uh, I'm excited about that. I don't shy away from that. It's Seven years has been great, but you know we, we, we have not gotten to the finals and we have not won a championship. And that, that, that is what uh, we're all doing this for. Wow. Well, he can be the first player to score 2,500 points, 1,300 rebounds, and 900 assists. Um, how can he get better? Um, it's funny, Adam. I go back for seven years now, and the conversation with Nicola was rarely, if ever, about basketball it wasn't about where well, you got to work on your left lefty hook you got to work on your three-point shot it was always about growing up handling adversity dealing with the refs being a leader finding your voice getting in better shape getting stronger and he's done all those things he's not perfect he can get better in those areas as well um but i i think for me here's a guy that again hopefully will soon be announced a back-to-back -back mvp he's gotta find his voice even more I think he could be a great leader, but because the hardest part being about uh, about being a leader, and I learned this from Jeff Van Gundy 22 years ago, you have to be willing to do the right thing every day. That's why there's not many leaders, because doing the right thing every day is hard. Nicola does that. I mean, I wish you guys, I wish there was a camera in there. The guys in our Felipe Eichenberg warm up. The guy goes through it like it's game seven of the finals. I mean, I mean that. I'm not making this up. And other guys go through it like, what are we doing this for? Everything Nicola does, he does hard in the right way. So when he does that, and he has the respect of everyone in that locker room, I think if, if he was willing to just be more vocal in good times and more importantly in bad times, it would be, it would be a profound impact. And you know, he's done it. He's done it more and more. But I think it has to get to the point where you know, it's – this is your team. Speak up. Hold people accountable. Because when he does that, it's really, really impactful for, for the whole locker room. And, uh, and, and, and he's still growing in that area. And I think once he gets to that point where, like, because the other part about being a leader, as we all know, is like, you can't worry if people like you or not. It's not about, this is not a sell ice cream if you want people to like you. you know I mean, this is a business. We have to win. And, and he's got to understand that because his, impact could be so potentially uh, game changing. You know, it's funny. I was with LeBron for five years as an assistant. So a little bit different, but um, I felt in watching him and grow in those five years, um, the work ethic, being there early, staying late was there. People never gave him credit for how hard he worked. Um, I felt early on LeBron wanted everybody to like him. Hey, is that, and I think he got to a point where he realized, hey, to win, it's not about you, anybody liking me. It's about I'm a great player, and I need to be a leader for this team and to be vocal. And I, I, I really feel once he embraced that, whether it was in Cleveland or to Miami or to wherever else he's gone, that allowed him to 
to take another uh, leap, if you will. Uh, so that's the one guy. I mean, Chris Paul is an amazing leader because he never cared if what people felt, but he was trying to lead his team and, and probably the best leader that I've ever been around in that regard, who never shied away from that responsibility. So, um, but again, I, I'm not saying that Nicole, Nicole has grown so much in that area. And I still think if he, he's still got a few more steps to go. And once he fully embraces that, I think he could be um, you know, just, just so impactful for this group. Oh, I think it's, you know, especially when you have some young players. I, like, I thought Jeff Green was was a really great addition for us. You know, we had Paul Millsap, you know, that, that older veteran that's been around the block who can speak of their experiences. And we've had countless young players come through that door that have benefited from that type of leadership. And so I, I think it's, you know, you can tell uh, functional locker rooms, they are going to have good leadership. Um, dysfunctional locker rooms are going to have zero leadership. And so it's about getting the right players in there um, and people leading different ways. You know, Paul Millstadt was not a rah-rah guy. He was more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Nicola leads by example every single day and at times with his voice. Um, so I, I think the impact that those types of players can have um, is really, really important. Can, can an inverse VP, though, if you have a, a real out boy, but not in a positive leadership style? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it can go both ways. I mean, uh, the other guy, one of the great leaders that I've been around was Isaiah Thomas. And even when he was here, uh, the guys that were around this team at that time, but Isaiah was taken out of the rotation and he was pissed about it, but he still did his job as a leader. He was still working with Monte Morris and Jamal Murray every day in their ear because he, he had been an all-star. He had been in the big playoff game. So, um, you know, you, but yes, you could have a negative leader in there who's dividing a team. And you never want that. That that's that, that that can divide a locker room in a hurry. Yeah. Yeah. A great question, Katie. I think it's um, exactly that. Uh, when the season ends, I give them their space. You know, uh, it used to be the season would end, and the very next day we do exit interviews, and I hated that because. You lose a game, you get home at midnight, and you're meeting a guy at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I felt it was unfair to the player because I haven't thought about your whole season. I'm coming in here and kind of giving you some, just some broad topic thoughts. And, and for me, it's give everybody space. 82 games, five playoff games, a lot of emotions. They don't want to see me. They don't want to hear from me. I don't want to see them. I don't want to hear from them. Um, and then after a few weeks, you know, you, you, you send a guy a message get their schedule, where are you going to be at? Um, you know, Marcus Howard, Jeff Green, Michael Porter are here right now working out. Zeke Najee has been coming in. Um, and then you find time to connect with each player individually and to kind of have that conversation, you know, on the season as, after they've had time to reflect as well as myself. And then you talk about the season. You talk about the off season, where they need to grow, develop, what areas they need to focus on. And it can't be eight things. Hey, Here's two or three things that you need to focus on. Um, and then try to find a way to spend time with them. We have, we, we have a great group of guys that come back to Denver quite a bit. Uh, when we go to Vegas for summer league, we have um, a lot of our veterans will come out to Vegas and we'll have workouts there. So just finding ways to give them their space, but then reconnect and have meaningful conversations about themselves and their futures. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, attacking this offseason. I mean, like it's, as I, as I mentioned, you know, I, I think the last four years, I, I mentioned a few times how we've, no one has more wins than us. That's all great. But this draft, this free agency, this summer league, our own internal player development, like um, we can't rest on any laurels because we haven't done anything. Like we have not won a championship. So for me, it's just attacking it as a coaching staff, Looking back on this past season, what were our blind spots? What did we not do well? What can we be better at? Whether it's offense, defense, or just how we do things. Always being open to change. I, I think there are certain coaches that are afraid of change and resist it. I, I embrace it, and we, we try to get ahead of it. Um, 
you know, but just Harrison, we, we have to, we have to get better. You know, one of my micro goals is finding a way every day as an organization to get better on a daily basis. And we have to this off season. And again, that yes, the draft, yes, free agency, yes, all the other stuff, but the guys that are here, like, that's what I love about Zeke Najee. He played in summer league, didn't play well, but he came back. He was better in year two. He showed me that he can play in the NBA. He can be a rotation player. He shot the ball lights out from three. He showed he can be a versatile defender. So all of our players, you know, I think the player development, the improvement from within ha is just as important as looking at the draft and free agency and all that. I have to be better. Our staff has to be better and our players have to be better. And, uh, and that is going to be what drives us every day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, as the years go on and uh, our guys mature and get better, um, you know, I think the stakes uh, are raised. So, yeah, definitely a huge summer for us. And uh, we we always go into every summer with the intention of trying to make the team better. And uh, we'll, we'll do the same this summer. Do you feel like in, in normal season where you guys have relied on, you know, around the two now playing for four months, do you guys feel more pressure as a, a front office to put the pieces around? Maybe more so this summer because you feel like you're at least being healthy through the next year. Uh, I don't know if pressure is the right word. I, I feel like it's a. I'm honored to be part of it. Um, I think uh, you know, I, I played in the NBA ten years, never played in the finals. Um, been a part of a couple of organizations, uh, a Western Conference Finals only with this team. So, to have a legitimate top guy, top three guy in the NBA and. He still had the task of trying to put a, a roster around him that he can get get the championship and go all the way. Is a, I think it's an honor. Um, when you look at the draft and free agency, looking at adding to the roster, is there one common trait or attribute you were looking to add to this roster? I mean, you know, you don't have to watch basketball for five minutes to realize that Joker likes to have shooters around him, and you know. Um, he expends a lot of energy during the game. I think when he's fresh, he's solid defensively. But as the game goes on, the season goes on, defense becomes a little bit more challenging. So guys that can hold their own and, and you know, like, as Coach Point, not allow those rim attacks to happen so often. You know, so, uh, hey, look, everybody in this league is always trying to find two-way players. And that's why this, I mean, they're hard to get, you know. Well, you know, we know who we have. We know that they'll, they'll get healthy. Um, we know Jamal is one of the premier two-way guys in the league. And um, I think defense will probably be a little bit harder for him when he comes back. But one of the one of the benefits of him taking his extra time is I think he'll be closer to himself when he comes back next year. And so, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we're going back to that team we had a couple of years ago because Jeremy Grant's in Detroit <laughs> and Paul Millsap is a little bit older. Yeah, yeah. So no, uh, no, but I think moving forward, we're just going to try to do the best we can to put a good team around uh, our best guys. And, uh, you know, I think uh, everybody knows what that looks like. Um, well, I think I know what you're getting at and where we're going financially and other teams have been there. You got to start finding a way to, to look at those guys a little bit more. I mean, I know coach has done a great job of it. Gave Bones a, a long runway to play, gave Zeke a long runway. Unfortunately, Zeke got banged up, but it's going to be a, a consistent part of our future where you know, maybe the guy we draft, if we draft this year and, and opt to use our pick and, as opposed to trading it, maybe that guy plays. We, we got to wait and see what happens in training camp, preseason, how the season unfolds. How available do you think that core group is knowing that you have two young guys in Bones and Zeke that don't crack rotation? It's probably hard to play a rookie on a team with title aspirations. I mean, is that, is that a, 
conversation that you guys are going to have? Do you feel like that first round pick there is a big part of it? Man, I know Tim and, and, and both Coach Malone, who's an avid NBA fan and watches a bunch and who watches college. Uh, I think we'll explore all options. Um, we're not married to our pick, but also we like some guys in the draft. So, um, you know, I think I think there was some definite because of our injuries and uh, the way we started out the season. There were some definite uh, places in our roster where you could see somebody coming in and being able to have a chance to earn some playing time. Yeah, I think in a word, fearless. Um, I think he plays the game the same where, wherever he's at, whether he's in a park in Delaware or at Chase Center um, playing against Steph Curry. So I think um, the energy he brings to the game, the confidence, the shot-making ability, I think uh, it makes him unique. Coach, how do you weigh the decision to make one potential bigger move or, or a decision to try and make a move that could be bigger? It's going to be a co combination of things. There's going to be, I mean, guys getting healthier. It's going to be internal improvement on both ends of the court. It's going to be a you know, player acquisition through trade, free agency, draft. I mean, it's going to be. Has to be uh, all hands on deck. We have to use everything at our disposal. Now, as a former player, how did you counsel or mentor Mike and Jamal throughout the course of the season? And maybe tell them to take a long view or something. I don't know if that's reasonable, but how did you help them? No, I think they, they both were pretty diligent about the rehab. I know both had periods of times where they would get down a little bit, but they fought that pretty well, fought through it pretty well. And uh, I was here last week, heard the, heard the questions. I think. The camaraderie that they were able to build, being around each other, was probably more helpful than any outside advice they could have had. Um, but you know, having said that, you know they're they're seeing our team out there, and they're both competitive guys, and they they want to be out and uh, be able to contribute. So um, I'm sure the hardest part was the tail end of the season. And um, the good thing is, is off season's here, and they can prepare for next year. Um, I just think it, it at times it can appear stale because the the when you're missing two max guys, you know, like uh, the offense can bog down some, and you know you're not as explosive as you are. I don't. I think we're far from stale. I think the guys are still pretty hungry. Um, I hard for me to see like us coming back with the exact same roster. Um, so I think there'd be some movement with Jamal and. Uh, MPJ being integrated back into the lineup, I think that'll give us a boost of energy. Now, what were your, what were the brightest spots uh, from this season for The bright spots is just uh, Nicola being able to run it back and essentially uh, carry the heaviest load in the league as far as production, minutes, responsibility, and also to see all the other guys out punch their weight class. You know, uh, to see Monty Morris be able to hold down a starting spot the whole year, which is not an easy thing to do, and uh, to be respectable. Um, you know, I know uh, from everybody from Will to uh, DeMarcus coming in, and, you know, I mean, DeMarcus has done it before, but all these guys, Jeff Green being the, the veteran and Bones being able to have the year. But I, I felt like because of the injuries we had, even the PJ, um, that people had to – uh, show up in different roles and, and do more than they're used to doing. Did Mark probably require some kind of mental grounding for the first Yeah, he's definitely a talented guy, and we, we enjoyed having him around. Um, uh, he's, we we're going to talk to his representation and see if there's anything there, but I, I think he enjoyed his time here. And, um, you know, being a former NBA five and mostly a backup. Like it's, I, I know it's no fun for the opposing five to have to face those two guys night in and night out. Just the next thing, Jake. What about Austin? Um, Malone has just thanked him gracefully for his support. Do you feel there's any ground competition there for him? Yeah, there's interest on our on our side. Again, you have to see what the marketplace for is for those guys too, as well. Like I'm sure they'll both have options. And Austin, uh, you know, towards the end of the season was really fantastic in his defensive assignment. So. Um, I think he's a guy that we would look look at trying to bring back if we could. I wonder if we could talk about Nicola. He's been casual conversation. We were talking about her GM, but as a player, all the different people we talked to, how has 
what does it say about him and what he means to her in her time in Yeah, I think he's earned more respect as time's gone on. I think they just appreciate uh, how smart he is, how competitive he is, um, you know, the, the way he can close games and carry a team, uh, usually the kind of things you hear.